Conversations for Health, dedicated to engaging discussions with industry experts, exploring evidence-based cutting-edge research, and practical tips. Our mission is to empower you with knowledge, debunk myths, and provide you with clinical insights. This podcast is provided as an educational resource for healthcare practitioners only. This podcast represents the views and opinions of the host and their guests and does not represent the views or opinions of Designs for Health, Inc. This podcast does not constitute medical advice. The statements contained in this podcast have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Any products mentioned are not intended to diagnose treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Now, let's embark on a journey towards optimal well-being, one conversation at a time. Here's your host, Evelyn Lambrecht. Welcome to Conversations for Health. I'm your host, Evelyn Lambrecht, and I'm joined here today by Dr. Chris Sadamo. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Evelyn. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Chris Sadamo has a PhD in epidemiology. He is the director for the Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Maryland, and he is on the scientific advisory board at Designs for Health. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You have led many clinical trials. You have written many research proposals. What is the current state of natural products research, and what are some of the challenges? Well, I, mean, I think it's probably the most exciting time to be a natural products researcher just because there's been an explosion in studies in recent years. Um, there's still challenges, though, as you noted, and there are many. I mean, ranging from financial, we need grants to do studies. And, uh, you know, most of us in academic medicine get our grants from the National Institutes of Health and they historically haven't funded many dietary supplement clinical trials, natural products clinical trials. They fund some, but it's a very small amount. So we're left essentially with, um, uh, you know, needing industry funding uh, to do these studies, and there's no patent protection. Uh, for doing these. So you get sort of these these financial challenges for doing it. So I commend the companies that do invest in clinical trials because it's not something they have to do. I mean, there's all these copycat companies out there that will just piggyback sort of on the research that other companies have done. Um, so that's that's one of the challenges. There are others when it comes to what we actually can study. So a lot of times we hear oh, there's no uh, evidence for whatever this supplement is for this condition. And, um, you know, it's tough to generate that evidence where you can't look at disease outcomes in, in many instances without um, what's called an investigational new drug from the FDA. We can talk about some of the details of that, but these challenges notwithstanding, there's still just an explosion of, of uh, clinical research that is, I think, really validating. We've known for a long time that dietary supplements can support optimal health in many ways. Talk about some more of the problems with getting studies approved by IRBs. Yeah. So for those that aren't really familiar, IRB is an institutional review board, and it's there to protect um, you know, the, the safety, really, of human subjects that are in research. And uh, that's a good thing, obviously. Um, there's been some exploitation research uh, in the past, certainly. Um, but with that, you know, a lot of times IRBs aren't really familiar with... Uh, with the SHEA and some of the provisions that it has um, where dietary supplements are regulated differently than drugs. And, and as a result, uh, you know, what's required uh, is different. You don't need technically an investigation of a drug. D stands, I-N-D, D drug. Dietary supplements aren't drugs. So what you end up with is you get some confusion at the IRB level in a lot of academic medical institutions. Uh, fortunately, mine has been pretty good at the University of Maryland. It helps that the IRB uh, vice chair was a classmate of mine, and I got to sit down and explain, like, like this is how this all works. Um, but other institutions, it could be quite difficult. So there are a lot of private IRBs, and uh, this can actually be of relevance because dietary supplement research isn't just limited to academicians and PhD and so on. This is something that can be done, you know, certainly in clinical practice, usually with some partnership with, a, you know, a research, a clinical research of some sort. Um, but there are a lot of private IRBs that that have a you know a, a solid understanding of uh, you know what's dache and and how dietary supplements and the research are, are a little bit different than drugs. You've mentioned dache twice. For anyone not familiar with dache, can you talk about? Yeah, that? so <laughs> dache is the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act going back to 1994 um, that established uh, dietary supplements, among other things, uh, defined what they are. Um, you know, something to, to supplement the diet orally. So, um, 
you know, things like probiotic skin creams and hair products that are not not actually considered dietary supplements, but there's different classes that we all know, you know, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, botanicals, and so on. Uh, but basically, it just established that they don't, uh, they are they're regulated, but they're regulated as foods and not as drugs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the INDs. What are some of the differences between clinical trials, say, in pharma and in our natural product space? And what is the cost of doing a trial, just yeah. so people have an idea of the difference? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think one big difference is just a very practical one is that pharma can patent, can and does patent their um, their medications. So they have much more financial incentive to do so they can pump tons of money into clinical trials, and then they can uh, reap the rewards of that investment. In natural products, we don't have that, so they're not patentable. Um, and you know, there's not as much of an incentive, which is again why I, I commend the companies that are doing the, the clinical trials, uh, because we need it. I mean, I, we know we're you know, in, in functional medicine, integrated medicine, um, you know, we're expanding the tool set to help our patients, and we wanna have evidence you know, for doing that, you know, the, the slam is, oh, there's not enough evidence, as I mentioned before, but so we need, uh, you know, the better players in the industry to take a role in funding good, solid clinical trials. And there have been, you know, quite a few in wide, a wide variety of categories, um, which is encouraging. I just think it's helping result in better clinical care and better self-care for people. I take a number of supplements because I, I think the evidence supports it and, and I feel like it's helped me. Yeah. And I think sometimes, uh, People perceive it as a negative thing if a trial is funded by a manufacturer or by a supplier, but we need somebody to <laughs> fund yeah. the study. You know, and that's really interesting because it's like, what's that, like seven degrees of Kevin Bacon or something? It's like two degrees of industry behind pretty much everything at the very least. And what I mean by that strange analogy is that, you know, industry funds most nutrition studies, period. You know, if you look at it, um, they're funded like the blueberry studies are funded by like the blueberry council or walnuts or whatever it might be. So and that's not actually a bad thing if it goes through peer review and the data are made transparent. So there's a trend, although it doesn't happen in all in, in some controversial areas now, especially uh, you don't always get the data. But a lot of times now when a study is published, uh, the, the journal actually will request that you make the data available for other researchers to take a look at. So I think as long as that happens, as long as it goes through a good, fair peer review, the data are available for other researchers to look at, that's a good thing. I mean, you know, a lot of pharma studies, most of their products are funded by, you know, these are things that are FDA approved and become standard of care. So, you know, when I hear about it sort of singled out in natural products industry, I'm like, well, that's just the way research largely works. What I mean by the, the one degree separation is that, you know, a lot of times even things that are NIH funded, you know, there's an NIH foundation that's funded by industry. You know, NIH's budget comes from Congress. You know, there's big lobbies that that fund the NIH. So this is just reality of, you know, if you look at most research, this is just the way that that it is. And, um, you know, is that is that ideal? Maybe not. But I think as long as you've got honest researchers and, and transparency and data that you that you can you can go down and, and see, then I think we're OK. Yeah. And how can practitioners evaluate clinical trials? What are some of the things to look for? Now, that's a great question. I mean, so you want to make sure that it's registered on clinicaltrials.gov. So, and most most of them are. And that what that is is that was a, a safeguard put into place really for pharma. So, uh, clinicaltrials.gov is there. So, the a priori, you know, when you do this, like, these are the outcomes that we think are of interest. You know, these are our primary outcomes, secondary outcomes. Because a lot of times, what was happening was, you know, pharma was doing three clinical trials and only publishing the ones that had good results. So now this applies to everybody, and that was a positive development. So, clinicaltrials.gov registration. Did they follow what's called the consort statement, which is a guidelines on uh, transparent reporting? Um, you know, you look at the conflicts of interest and they're going to be there a lot of times, but as long as they're transparent and uh, and so on and so forth. So published in a, you know, PubMed index journal, uh, that kind of thing. So those are, those are the types of things to, to look at. What, what is it? Are the conclusions reasonable? You know, if it, if it feels like an advertisement, you know, it, it, it may be, but um, those are just some of the things that I would suggest looking at. Yeah. And what about some of some companies I've seen them using maybe a survey and where it's not published, it's like unpublished data. Mm -hmm. Can we still, you know, draw conclusions from that? Is that fair? Yeah. You know, there's all different levels of evidence. I mean, there's yeah. your, um, uh, you know, there's your, your published uh, trials and so on, but there's, there's all different levels. I think there's even the level of traditional usage of something or, 
you know, you know, we know X number of people are using this and there's been no adverse events or something. So I think I think it can be reductions to look just at randomized controlled trials. And there are people that, that are that way. I think that's important, but I think there's a variety of different levels of evidence. So I mean, would a survey that hasn't been published and so on be as rigorous as a good clinical trial? No, but it, it you know, it's, it still could give us good information sometimes. Yeah, I definitely agree with that as an herbalist because yeah. many botanicals have thousands of years of usage. So yeah, yeah. for sure. Definitely. Or, and even ones that are modern supplements that there may not be a lot of studies in a particular area. Uh, but we talk about the safety, because I feel like when we think about evidence, we think about how well do we know that, it, that it's safe. So a new product, I don't care how big the single clinical trial is, like if we're talking about a, med a, a medication, a vaccine, something like that, you know, if it's new, it's new, you know, but if it's turmeric or ginger, it's been used for thousands of years, you know, not to say that it, it can't ever hurt somebody. Um, sometimes they'll have lead and so on, but the better companies are doing third party lab testing to make sure it's not the case. But we know that people have been using those things, you know, for, for a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. I think when we're looking at pharmaceutical trials on drugs, you're looking at a specific outcome, right? But in functional medicine and in integrative medicine, there are so many factors and often we're not looking at someone's genetic SNPs. We're not looking at what they're eating because we're just trying to test one specific thing. But I feel like when practitioners are treating a patient, they're looking at the whole picture. So of course in research, we can't account for that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I think <laughs> I, I think that's one of the things that makes research in, in our field challenging sometimes because yeah, if you're looking at a pharmaceutical, it's usually a single pathway at least that we know of, you know, at least that's how it's designed and in you know, a single outcome. But I think we think about biological systems as we do in, in functional medicine, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, sometimes we, uh, we're also very aware of um, person, the need for personalization. Um, I think, you know, if we look at some of the recent vitamin D trials that don't look at that, you know, I think we need to look at baseline levels of a nutrient, certain, uh, you know, variants that may influence at someone's age. I mean, there's so many, so many different factors that can influence the response. I think we're maybe a little bit more aware of that in functional medicine, you know, in conventional medicine, you might do like, like a subgroup analysis. Like we looked at and see how did the product do among, I don't know, some factor, those that had worse disease or those that were older, whatever it might be, but we're constantly thinking about those things. So I think in that sense, you know, personalization is built into kind of the DNA of what we do. Yeah. And it would be cool if we could do that in pharmaceutical trials also. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, I think there's, you know, there's been this whole uh, year of personalized medicine and so on that, you know, we were able to, to um, you know, make great discoveries with the genome and so on, but I'm not sure that's really reaped the, the, the true potential of what's, what's there yet. So I think it's because there's, it's more than just the genes. It's, you know, it's our microbiota. Right. Uh, all kinds of, of other, our ex, ex, exposome, you know, right. all the chemicals are around, it's our lifestyle, all these other things that, that I think a lot of people in our field can take a leadership role in, in you know, bring them to the forefront. Yeah. And what are some of the other factors that practitioners should look for when choosing a dietary supplement? You mentioned third-party testing. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, get this, uh, practitioners and consumers alike, is how do you make those decisions? Because, you know, product A and product B of the same you know, nutrient or uh, supplement can be very different. So you, you mentioned third-party lab testing. There's a number of good ones, NSF, USP, and, and, and a variety of other ones. And I, I really commend that because it's voluntary. It's a sign that the company cares enough, you know, to invest extra resources to make sure that their product has on the label what it says it has and doesn't have things you don't want, like heavy metals, you know, uh, high micro counts, other things like that. So that's a, that's a really big one. You know, when you can find published research on the finished product, that's great too, you know, uh, for, for certain. Those that, I, I'm not a real big fan of proprietary blends. I mean, I get it from a business case sometimes, but that makes it difficult to, for the consumer to know exactly how much is there. Now, you, now you do know that the, t the ingredient li listed first is one that's in the highest amount and the one that in the bottom. And you see, like we call some of those pixie dusting where you know, you'll see, oh, look, the, all the good stuff's at the bottom because those are the expensive ingredients. Mm -hmm. So I think typically, you know, proprietary blends are something that I'm uh, not real crazy about. But yeah, third-party lab, um, you know, peer-reviewed research on it. Um, you know, a, uh, a brand that's been around for a while, I think. So those are, those are some things that I, I, that I come to think of. 
And what are resources that practitioners can go to and maybe even share with their patients to make informed decisions about supplement usage? This is great. I'll even tell you, like you would think my first place to go is PubMed and it's always a backup, but I actually usually go to examine.com first because it's got such a good team and everything links to PubMed. So that's like my first pass if there's some effort in most supplements at this point, but if there's something that I haven't, don't know a whole lot about, you know, I'll go and take a look at that. And I recommend that, you know, to patients and, and practitioners, because with that, for those that aren't familiar with the site, it, it will provide sort of an overview, high level overview of any supplement, but then it gets into, you know, usage considerations. Like if you go to for curcumin, you know, like the solubility and these kinds of things, which you might, how much you take for certain conditions, it's going to vary, you know, what potential interactions are there. And then even like, you know, not only is there links directly to all this, the studies in PubMed, but deep like mechanisms and all all types of things that so it goes really deep i mean the curcumin one i give you an example i think it has like 400 citations on the examine.com page and then of course i'll go and i'll look at at pubmed for if they're usually pretty nicely updated but if there's something else so like that uh natural medicines database is another one um i like uh not all products are on this but uh labdoor.com consumer lab these are other ones that are they go and get off the shelf. Um, they're not perfect we don't have to get into the details of that, but it's something, again, you can recommend to patients to look at sometimes. Um, and then I like Mitovin too. Um, so that's uh, something that, because a lot of times, again, I think in functional medicine, our patients are a little bit more aware of the impact that medications can have on nutrient depletion, but uh, Mitovin will um, uh, very clearly say, well, then we know like statins CoQ10. I'm taking a, a statin and say, well, this can deplete CoQ10 and, and other things like that too. So it makes a very clear um, indication that, uh, because this is a really under-recognized problem in uh, in medicine right now. So those are some that, that, that jumped to mind. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you. What do you think are some of the most underrated supplements based on research that have demonstrated effectiveness? So you're probably going to think I'm going to say like some red hot new supplement, but yes. the ones that I think are are underrated um, are actually some oldies but goodies. And my first uh, would be creatine um, monohydrate. I think it's a fantastic supplement. We typically think of that for athletic performance and strength and so on, for which it's very good. But it's also got some really interesting data for um, cognition and even as a monotherapy for depression. And that's because it basically helps our, our body, you know, make ATP. So it, it can provide energy. So um, it's especially important for vegetarians and vegans because creatine, we typically obtain through animal products. Um, so if you look at some of the, the studies that looked uh, at different subgroups, they're the ones that tend to benefit the most from creatine because they're mm -hmm. not getting it in their diet. But I think it it's great for anybody, you know, especially older adults that are wanting to preserve muscle mass. But, but, I, but I love it. I take it. I've taken it for mm -hmm. a long time. What amounts for depression? Um, usually five grams a day and, okay. and with, um, with creatine, you know, there's this old sort of like bodybuilding, um, thing where like you would have to load, but that really doesn't seem necessary mm -hmm. where you would take a whole bunch of it. And that's where you might get some side effects. It has very few side effects, but that's where you could get some of the water retention, some of those types of things. So you want to stay hydrated when you're drinking. It helps draw water into the, to the muscles. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think five grams a day typically, and then you let it build up over time. So I think that's a, a wonderful supplement with it, with an excellent, so what, Excellent track record of safety, hundreds of publications uh, used for all kinds of things. That'd be one. Uh, the next one's another only but goodie, but it's glucosamine chondroid. Um, again, we think of it typically for joint health. And most of the studies are positive. We won't get too much into the rabbit hole. There's there, the GATE trial is the one that a lot of people say, well, didn't that big trial show that didn't work? It actually didn't. And maybe I'll get into this a little bit because it is pretty yes, interesting. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, GATE trial was a large NIH funded uh, trial that compared uh, glucosamine to chondroitin to the combination to placebo to Celebrex. And in the primary analysis, so they did a Womac as a, as a uh, composite like arthritis pain and function, the 20% um, improvement was the primary outcome. Seems kind of arbitrary and, and maybe it was, but that, that's what they chose. Again, they registered that in clinicaltrials.gov. So you know, that, that's the value of going back and checking that. But what they found was that in the, in the main analysis of, of all people, is those with knee arthritis, that um, there was a huge placebo effect. It was like 60%. So we know that that's pretty big for pain, yeah. right? Uh, there's a big placebo effect. Um, the uh, glucosamine chondroitin was like 66% that improvement, but it missed statistical significance. It was p-value 0.09. And Celebrex was statistically significant. But if you look at the moderate to severe group, which is most people who are taking it, mm -hmm. Glucosamine chondroitin was statistically significant, and Celebrex wasn't. That wasn't anywhere in all the media reports about this, that Celebrex, this big blockbuster drug, 
did not improve um, osteoarthritis uh, in you know those with moderate to severe pain. Like so, it's like wow. it's just that sort of selective reporting that we get with a lot of this stuff, and I won't get into too much of the whys of that. But but the vast majority, that study notwithstanding, the vast majority of studies show that it's actually non inferior to uh, COX two inhibitors like Celebrex and can improve joint uh, pain and function. Now, what I think is interesting about why I think it's underrated is that beyond joint health, which is a big problem for a lot of people, it actually has been shown to reduce um, all-cause mortality after adjusting for a bunch of different things. And that's other supplements that are really good ones like omega-3 fats and vitamin D and so on actually did not, but glucosamine chondroitin did. It's fascinating. And it is really interesting. We don't hear a lot about that. These are, these are repeated big studies with like, you know, 25,000 people plus. And I think it's larger because it's such a, a nice anti-inflammatory. So it's an it's an old uh, product, but it's a really good one. Um, well, it's a little newer, last one, but I don't worry with this. I take a bunch of things, but it would be astaxanthin. I like that too. I mean, that's a uh, um, in a carotenoid, and um, you know, I like it for its ability to go to the macula. You know, lutein and zeaxanthin are good ones too, um, and even to s- sort of serve as a, a bit of a mild um, sunblock in a way. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of interesting activity, how that protects cells, you know, uh, a little bit layer of cells. So I think that's another, another cool product. Very cool. Can you share some of the trials that have been done on astaxanthin? Astaxanthin doesn't have as many trials. I would say it's a little <laughs> bit different than the other two. I mean, there's been like hundreds of studies on both of those, um, but they've looked at, at eye function. They've looked at, you know, cellular protection. Some of these are in, in, in human beings um, that I, I think is, is pretty interesting. So it's, we're still kind of in the early innings. There haven't been the large multicenter trials as there have for the others. Uh, but I think mechanistically, just as a way to protect ourselves from oxidative stress, which we're all around all the time, mm-hmm. um, is helpful. And it's sort of hard to get in the diet. If you get, it's red. So um, if you get like a, a really nice, like wild caught salmon, you know, sockeye salmon, that red is the azazanthin. Um, but it's not in food as much as a lot of other yeah. know, carotenoids are. Since you're always evaluating research, what are some of the biggest nutrient deficiencies that we see? Well, I think the biggest one's probably vitamin D. Um, that became especially apparent during COVID when um, just like unbelievably strong protection against adverse um, and severe outcomes from COVID were th- for those who were, who were vitamin D replete. I don't think I got nearly enough attention. I was like screaming from the mountaintops, let's get vitamin D in everybody because it was so uh, you know profound. If you look at it consistently, systematic reviews, meta-analyses, those that had higher vitamin D levels, um, you know, were much less likely to have, you know, hospitalization, death, and so on. And, you know, some would say, well, that's the, con- you know, there's some confounding in observational studies of vitamin D, but also the clinical trials look quite good as well. So um, I, I think uh, vitamin D would be, would be the one, probably the most important, I think, especially as we, you know, spend more time inside and, and, and this type of deal, especially if you live in Northern latitudes. And then magnesium would be the other one too. We're just not um, getting sources enough sources of it in our in our diet, you know, from leafy greens and so on. Although sometimes there's 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 controversy about whether leafy greens are really the best source because you know sometimes you buy these things are bound to anti nutrients, oxalates, and those kinds of things. But it's it's like salmon bones and these kinds of things that people don't really like to eat very much. So we're not getting very much magnesium either. So I think supplementing with both those two nutrients is a, a, a important thing to do. Let's talk a little bit more about vitamin D. I've noticed that in conventional medicine, we stop testing vitamin D. A lot of doctors don't want to test for it, and insurance is not covering it a lot of times. Why is that? Yeah, there. So I think a lot of this is is deriving from the study called the Vital Trial, and an accompanying um, New England Journal of Medicine editorial. So, um, and the basically the Vital Trial found that this was a study that was looking at among other things osteoporosis and. Uh, they found that in that trial, um, vitamin D supplementation did not decrease the risk of osteoporosis um, in this particular group. Though there's some really important caveats that are, I'd say they're more than just caveats. They're like, hit you over the head, important factors that didn't get discussed, though the authors themselves talked about them. And that was that they didn't actually test who was um, vitamin D replete or deficient at baseline. So Again, uh, you know, everyone's a little bit different. We need to personalize this. And we have a robust literature, you know, Cochrane reviews um, of many, many trials over the years that show that vitamin D reduces the risk of osteoporosis and fractures. So this one study comes along, a big study, you know, uh, admittedly. um, And then all of a sudden, you know, we have editorials that we should stop testing vitamin D. 
and we don't think about all of the other conditions that vitamin D has been associated with, you know, everything from like IBD, you know, again, certainly osteoporosis and falls and headache, depression and so on. So it was a baffling suggestion um, given how fundamental we know vitamin D, vitamin D is to human health. It's not a very invasive or expensive test. Um, so I, I, I actually, we, uh, a number of us wrote letters to the editor of New England Journal of Medicine, it didn't get published. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an area where I think there's been rightful pushback because it just, it seems like of all of the waste in medicine today, testing vitamin D is very low on my list in terms of, uh, you know, the cost that that has and the potential r return that you could get by getting levels replete. Yeah. Let's talk about something else that's controversial right now, uh, in the literature or maybe on social media. <laughs> um, there's a lot of controversy around protein intake. Some are saying, you know, we need to be consuming more protein. Everybody's under consuming protein. Some are saying now, uh, you know, or some research has shown that protein intake is, uh, high protein intake is related to shorter lifespan. What are your thoughts on this and what does the research show? Yeah, so I have many thoughts on this. I'll try to <laughs> condense it as much as possible. Um, I think that uh, my doctoral work was in hip fracture recovery and looked at, at uh, micronutrients and how that you know um, influenced physical function so on after that. So my lens is kind of from that aging side in human beings and seeing just how devastating sarcopenia or loss of muscle mass is uh, to um, you know uh, like not just longevity but uh, you know health span, you know the ability to function well. Study after study shows that sarcopenia is uh, associated with all-cause mortality and, and lots of other sequelae of aging. So you want to keep your lean body mass. We know that with age, um, our ability to for muscle protein synthesis decreases. We need to get more protein to compensate for that. I think pretty much everyone agrees on that part, though it still gets missed uh, sometimes. Um, I think when you think about uh, you know challenges in society today with things like... Uh, you know, obesity and you know, uh, those diseases related to that and issues with, um, uh, you know, diet quality and so on. Protein is the most satiating macronutrient. It has the most, the highest thermogenic capacity. You know, it, it's one that, that I think, uh, we really ought to, th I, I think people generally actually under consume, you know, but I think even more importantly than how many grams they're eating. And this is, this is what I think is really important is the quality of protein. So they're not all created the same. The quality of the protein you're going to get in uh, broccoli and a, a grass-fed steak is very, very different. You know, not to say bro broccoli is great too, but it's not a great protein source because you need to look at, at the bioavailability of that protein. So it's not just be the number of grams. There's been a number of good scales uh, that have been put forth. And I always have a hard time remembering what the acronym stands for. But there's the pro the PDCAAS is one way. Basically, it gets down into protein digestibility and looks at different things. So like sort of at the top, you get whey. That's, it's really bioavailable. You're able to take those amino acids. They're in the right kind of um, uh, ratios that we want as humans. And then you get things like, uh, you know, wheat and rice and so on that are lower. So I think we need to, to think about the quality of the protein. To Generally speaking, animal protein is of, of higher quality. You can, you can get their good uh, plant-based protein powders today that will actually look at, um, you know, mirror the amino acid content that we want ideally as humans. So think about amino acids and not just the number of grams of protein would be my suggestion to people because this, this can have a really big effect. All kinds of studies too that are interesting. I mean, just in terms of like to get the same amount of amino acids, you have to eat a lot more plants. Like, so you're going to get a lot more food and calories and potential GI distress and that kind of stuff than you would from good, good sources. And I think whey is probably the ultimate, you know, uh, certainly as far as supplemental protein goes, but I could probably leave it there. I could, we could go on, but. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about human research versus maybe animal research when it comes to protein? Yeah, intake? I think it's interesting. This ties a little bit into the time-restricted eating stuff too. I mean, there's a lot of interest in mTOR and. Um, I think there is a, uh, you know, a time and place potentially for restricting mTOR, but definitely not all the time, especially not as, uh, you know, we're, I guess we're all aging, but especially not as you get into older age. Um, because what happens in mice, we've seen this in all kinds of studies, is different than in rats, but it's different than what happens in humans. Um, this also touches into the time-restricted eating a little bit too, you know, how long you need to go. I'm a big advocate of it, as you know, 
Um, but I, you know, getting into autophagy and so on, it may take a, a mouse 12 hours or 24 hours actually, per, but that's a lot longer than a human. So we, there's a long history. There's been a lot of good papers on it too, about how we've missed the target a lot of times with, you know, agents that didn't work well in mice that would ultimately work well in humans. And then agents that worked well in, in mice, but didn't work very well in humans because we're different. And I think when you look at, at, at diets, you know, we're probably best this is controversial, I guess, too, but probably most likely, I think most arguably we're omnivores. You know, I know there's strong vegan and strong carnivore contingents too, but um, you know, mice and rats are different. They're 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 not. I mean, they're not us. And so, um, so I think diet studies in particular also have some some questionable translation to humans. Yeah. What are some of your personal favorite supplements, and why? Well, I you know creatine and, and glucosamine uh, for sure. Um, I take a couple different kinds of magnesium. I get a pretty good amount in my diet. But I take um, uh, magnesium l threonate. You know, I like the fact that it gets to the to the brain, and I take uh, citrate kind of for the rest of my body. Um, I uh, I like I, I'm kind of a poor methylator, so I like uh, methyl donating agents, donating agents. Um, so TMG. Uh, I take actually I, I like I really like collagen, <laughs> so I take I take quite a bit of collagen. I take a variety of those. Those are some of the ones that, that come to. I like cod liver oil. I mean, these, these are all things that I, I think are helpful. Since you mentioned collagen, mm -hmm. you gave a lecture a few months ago on collagen, on research on collagen. Can you share some highlights from yeah, that? Yeah, there's a lot of good research on collagen for um, skin health, uh, for joint health. Um, it's just a, a, a major component of connective tissue. And we really don't get the amounts that we, we used to get, you know, when we're eating, you know, broths and stocks and, 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 you know, knuckles and these things that most people don't eat these days. Um, so I think that's one of the things that, you know, again, I, I think animal proteins is health promoting if it's, if it's from a good, well-sourced animal, those kinds of things. But if there were issues with methionine, which some people argue, again, there's a lot of debate on that stuff, getting more glycine that you get from collagen. I think that's one of the key keys to, to collagen. Now you could just take glycine too, but I think one of the, the keys of collagen is, is it's a really good source of glycine that can balance out methionine. And glycine has a lot of other potential benefits for sleep, and it's got some interesting effects on neurotransmitters and so on. So I think I think collagen is a great thing to to add uh, to the diet for anyone interested in joint, skin, and, and hair health. And what are your top health practices for personal health and well-being? Yeah, so I think um, I mean, the obvious stuff like you know eating a nutrient dense diet, not eating not eating as many ultra processed foods, um, you know, getting good sleep, trying to be consistent with that, having some form of stress management practice. Those are, you know, kind of the cornerstones. I, I also have really gotten into, I, I, I like, I like time restricted eating. Um, you know, I don't, I don't do, I've tried doing longer fasts and so on. I think some people can overdo it with the fasting for sure. You know, so I think, I think being somewhat sensible with that and if you feel yourself getting, cause it's a stressor, you know, if you feel yourself, if you get too many hermetic stressors, you know, which we see a lot of people doing sauna and ice baths and real intense exercise and, and, and fasting, like that can be a little bit much, especially if you've got a stressful life. But, but I think some form of time restricted eating specifically on the, uh, giving yourself ample time before going to bed, you know, not eating a real heavy meal, g giving like three hours or so, and you'll see you get my aura ring here. You'll see typically your, your sleep scores improve from doing that. I also really like, uh, uh, chronobiology just in general, that's part of it, but light and, uh, you know, being aware of that blocking um, blue and green light at night. So there's, we have actually got in our house, red light bulbs in the bedroom and got like those dorky red glasses and this thing. So the, a lot of people, the red will also block green. So you get the orange ones, but, um, and then also getting morning light. So I think again, kind of tapping into that and also being aware of lighting throughout the day. So light, um, you know, this is blank as medicine, but light is kind of medicine. So getting bright light during the day, getting outside where you can, uh, think about what's that, what I think is interesting. You can get these little lux meters to measure mm -hmm. how much you know, the brightness of the light you're getting. You know, going outside even on a, on a cloudy day, you're going to get uh, maybe not as many as with the, these bright lights here, but you're going to get uh, a lot then too. So I'd say even when, it, when it's overcast, trying to get outside and getting light during the day, I'm a really big believer in that for mood. And you're going to get the vitamin D, but you're also going to get, there's more to it than that from sunlight. You're going to get, you know, it's nitric oxide production. And, and other benefits uh, from that. So those are some things. And just toxin mitigation, there are a lot of different things. So I, I think, you know, uh, HEPA purifier, air purifiers, and, you know, uh, with water and these kinds of things, and just being aware of our, you know, not using too many like chemical um, cleaners in the house and fragrances and that kind of stuff. So those, that's a variety of things, but I think those are all things that are uh, fairly accessible, but only cost 
much to do those things. Right. But they can, I, I think they can have great returns. Yeah, I know you're a big fan of fasting. What was that longest fast you did recently? Yeah, I did five <laughs> days. I don't think I'm gonna be doing that again either. I was really struggling. I, I think some people do really well with that, but um, I, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I done it coming after a conference. A lot of, like days I travel. A lot of times I don't, I don't eat, and then I was like, I'll just keep it going, and then kind of wanted to push myself. I, I, I do think for me, everyone's a little different. I, I do pretty well by doing like 24 hours, you know, one like like maybe once every few weeks, but I typically do 16, eight. I don't do anything too extreme. I found that works pretty well for me. Um, the times where I've gone much deeper or done much longer fasting, I would feel a little bit of that overstress where it's like, cause you do, I mean, when you, when you're doing the time restricted eating, you're going to get more norepinephrine and that can be good. You're going to get more orex in these, these alertness chemicals, but you get too much of that for too long. You know, it, it can be a little bit of an issue. So I think it's like anything else. You don't want to exercise for six hours a day you know, but you do want to exercise. So I think it's the same kind of thing of not pushing it too much with a lot of these. Next time, maybe four days. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, let's see. I think I'm going to, yeah, that was, that was an eye-opening experience. I, and other people have done that and they've felt great. Other people have done 10 day water fasts or longer. I, I don't know. We'll see. It's going to be a little while before I, I do that again, but um, I think I'll probably do 24 hours tomorrow at least. When all I'm right. Back home. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is something that you've changed your mind about through all of your years in integrative medicine? I think one is the importance of, of breathing. I mean, I think some of those things I, I, I talked about too, about not eating. I used to eat right before I went to bed. So I, I did, you know, I was in powerlifting and stuff like that. And I always heard you're going to go catabolic if you don't have your casein right before you go to bed, that kind of stuff. It's just not, not at all true. So I think that's one thing that was, I realized that years ago, but um, more real, more recently, the importance of nasal breathing, I think has, has really, um, I felt the differences with that. So I mentioned you've had my nose broken a few times and, and, uh, I started, I basically was, became a mouth breather, maybe as long back as I, as I can remember and have just more consciously been breathing through my nose, being more aware of my breathing, being aware of email apnea. I suggest that to anybody too. That's such mm. a common phenomenon that we, I found myself so, uh, doing it all the time, not just emails, but, but like when you're really concentrating on something like I'm not breathing. I just realized I'm doing it right now. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 I think, I think, I think a lot of us do. I, it was a, it took a, a long time of awareness. Like, am I breathing? Am I breathing? I'm just gonna make a mantra and gotten much better at that. So I think the combination of, and what, how it's manifested was that I feel like I need less coffee. You know, I feel like my mental endurance is better because I'm breathing more regularly and it's hard to do while you're talking. So you can't, <laughs> you can't, you can't. but, um, you know, I think uh, that that's, that's been one. So look up for those who haven't heard of it, look up email apnea. You're probably doing it. And you'd probably benefit by not doing it. And then, you know, mouth taping these things. I've had to do that. Just some people just naturally breathe through their nose, but I'm really not one of them. I had to had to do some work. But it, it, that that's one that I kind of picked up in integrated medicine, and, and I'm glad I did. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here and sharing, and thank you for your expertise and all your contributions to this field. You're very welcome. Thank you, Evan. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations for Health. Check out the show notes for the resources shared on today's episode. Please share this podcast with your colleagues, follow, rate, or leave a review wherever you listen, and thank you for designing a well world with us. This is Conversations for Health with Evelyn Lambrecht, dedicated to engaging discussions with industry experts, exploring evidence-based, cutting-edge research, and practical tips 